I think renewable energy can save us from natural disasters, or at least help save us from natural disasters. In fact, I think electricity already saves us from disasters. Within the first few minutes of my day this morning, I got light, I got toast, and I got coffee. Mmm, coffee. And I think, it, we can, I can thank electricity for that. The electricity for that came from 600 kilometres away and saved me from the disaster of working in the dark, being hungry, and being allowed out into public without enough caffeine in my system. It's a complete disaster. <laughs> of course, electricity or renewable energy can save us from other disasters. And the obvious one with renewable energy is pollution. At present, we generate about 75% of our electricity in Australia from coal, and coal produces pollution. But we know about that. What I'd like to you today, talk to you today about is other disasters, what we call natural disasters. It's floods, it's fires, it's earthquakes, it's cyclones. These aren't just words. These are people's lives, and this is, this is damage. And the number of natural disasters is increasing. Since the 1960s, it's grown exponentially. It's not just nature, it's us as well. Human beings are part of the problem. You see, a disaster only happens when a natural hazard meets a vulnerability. If a natural hazard passes through an unpopulated area, we don't call it a disaster. But if a natural hazard, such as a cyclone or tornado, tornado comes through a large populated area, it becomes a disaster quite quickly, especially if that population isn't ready. One way for populations to get ready is by having really, really good critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure are the infrastructures that we use every day, that we rely on without even thinking about them. So much effort goes into making them that just work that we don't need to. Things like telecommunications, it's the road and transport system, systems, ports, airports, water and sewerage, and of course, electricity. And these infrastructures are all interlinked. They, they all play a part, and that makes them strong. Electricity relies on communications for delivery and for control. El communications relies on electricity to even work. Ports rely on electricity to load and unload ships. And water treatment relies on electricity to pump the water to where you can get it out of your tap. But the problem is, the very thing that makes them strong during normal operation can make them sometimes weak in a disaster. If you lose one, the, you may lose the others as well. And this creates problems for society. You see, it's not the infrastructure that's the important thing. This infrastructure creates amenity within society. So if you don't have electricity to a communication system, it's harder to work with the emergency services. If you don't have power, water, and good road access to hospitals, it's very hard for the hospital to provide life-saving health services, especially after a natural disaster. This is Cyclone Yazzie from 2011. Its size was so great that it would have engulfed the United Kingdom and most of Europe as well. Its power was so intense that it was still classified as a cyclone even when it was 900 kilometres inland. And this is what it does to electricity networks. The reconstruction after a disaster such as Cyclone Yazzie takes a lot of effort and time and money. And it's all hands on deck. Cyclone Yazzie was actually the largest mobilisation of electrical workers in the history of Australia, even me. So if you look at my hands, you can tell that I do spend a fair bit of time behind a desk. But I do go out in the field, and after Cyclone Yazzie, I was out in the field for 14 days, going ahead of the construction crews and surveying the damage so they knew what to bring with them to repair them. And what I found out there was something I found quite interesting. On day one, people were really pleased to see us. Here's a bit of toast off the barbie. On day two or three, they were politely asking when the electricity would be back. By about day five, they were demanding. And what I realised was, it's really stressful not having electricity for a lot of people. And the value of electricity is actually at its highest when it's not there. The way that we deliver electricity at the moment is, is through large electricity grids. The electricity grid in Australia stretches from South Australia through Victoria to Tasmania and all the way up the east coast to far north Queensland. And the electricity that we are using even now 
in Queensland, the second largest state in Australia, comes from two main sources, central Queensland and southwest Queensland. So the electricity for the coffee that I drank this morning really came from 600 kilometres away. My coffee started being made 600 kilometres from here. But renewable energy is making us rethink about the way that we deliver electricity. It's allowing us to think about different ways that we can set up the grid to deliver this really important critical infrastructure. You see, electricity is generated close to the fuel source, and that's why the electricity is concentrated in, in central Queensland and southwest Queensland, because that's where the coal is. But there's no limit to where the wind blows, there's no limit to where the sun shines, and there's no limit to where we can grow crops to create biofuels for renewable energy. So we can put energy into that network at almost any place. And if we're really smart about it, we can do it as a microgrid, self-sustaining microgrids. They can be any size that we like. So they could be the size of an office block, they could be the size of a suburb, they could be the size of a hospital or a university campus or even an entire town. And if one part of the grid goes down, it doesn't have to affect the other parts of the grid. They sustain each other through the energy that's injected at them from the renewable energy that's generated close by. And that renewable energy doesn't have to come from 600 kilometres away. It can be 100 kilometres away, or 50 kilometres away, or 10 kilometres away, or even just metres. This can affect a lot of people. This is a composite photo of the world at night taken from space. The, the shape of the world is literally drawn with electric light. Every single person that turned on one of those lights can be affected by this idea. That means you. That means the person next to you and the person next to them. So we in the electricity industry kind of have a duty to you guys to make sure that we are thinking of ways in which we can make our electricity supply more reliable. And renewable energy is really allowing us to do that. But I don't think this idea should be limited to the electricity industry. I think this idea can be expanded to all other critical infrastructures as well. So if you're building a port, or you're building a road, or you're building an airport, or even just a house, think about ways in which you can integrate disaster resilience into the construction of the new infrastructure that you're building. And there's plenty of examples from all around the world where you can do this. In Kinshasa in Africa, for every dollar they spend in flood mitigation, and this is simple ditches and sandbags, ahead of floods, they save $47 from the flood event. And that's not taking into account the, the unmeasured cost of problems from dirty flood water like cholera. In Vietnam, they're building natural storm surge barriers so that when typhoons come through, the waves don't overtop the settlements there. And they're doing that with mangroves. A million dollars has been spent by the Red Cross, and that's saving the Vietnamese government $7 million a year on dike maintenance alone. There are plenty of examples from around the world. In fact, the World Bank says that if we spend, only spend a bit of time thinking about the way that we integrate disaster resilience and climate change into our infrastructure projects, it's only going to add about 1% to 2% to the total value of the project. For 1%, let's do it right the first time. In Australia, we're planning to spend over $1.1 trillion on infrastructure in the next 30 years and we can do that well. But you see, it's not actually the infrastructure that's the important part. This is the important part. If we do this well, we'll be saving lives and getting communities back on their feet after a natural disaster. Because isn't that why we're here? To change the world. Thank you. <laughs>